Okay guys, so this is going to be CCIE lab experience, uh, how I got utterly destroyed, well not really, uh, last week. Talk a little bit about the preparation that I went through, uh, I'll talk about uh, how it was, so the troubleshooting, the venue, and the configuration portion, and we'll talk about some changes that I'll be doing and what I'll be doing to prepare for the next time, which is in December and uh, some cool things uh, that I'll be making for you guys uh, because my loss is your gain. So uh, even though I failed, it's uh, it's all right. It's not, not too bad because uh, it caused me to study even more and make up more tools and uh, uh, other things to help you guys out. So when you guys take the CCIE lab, uh, you know, hopefully you don't need to take it as many times. All right, so let's see here. This is being, uh, it's not really being live streamed, but it is being recorded. And we don't have any other presenters, so that's okay. And then at the end of every section, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna give you guys a chance to ask questions and please ask questions. Uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be repeating the question uh, for the video. Uh, you can either chat uh, by typing or you can ask me with uh, audio since uh, most of you have uh, mics. So in the room, any recent passes of any kind, CCNA, CCNP, IE, Red Hat, Uh, six months. Nice. We will count ITIL. Why not? <laughs> and Mark? So. Cool. Awesome. And Scott passed Fortinet. Oh, I'm scared about it. Yeah, it's yeah. A lot of money to throw away. Yeah, we'll be talking about that. So Scott, uh, JNCI, and Fortinet. Oh, awesome! Very cool. Cool. Kind of like all over the place with uh, different tests and different vendors. That's good. All right. So the next Router Gods member is on the CCIE firing line. We've got uh, Kim. Uh, Kim's a guy. And he runs a blog called Knock Ninja. The link is right there in the hackpad. He is October 25th. Holy shit. Wait a second here. That's tomorrow. <laughs> All right. So uh, we wish him luck. Uh, he doesn't uh, come to many meetings. Um, th there's a lot of people that are members, but they don't come to meetings a lot. But I know him. Uh, end of November, we have Roger Perkin. He also runs a very good blog. His blog is, uh, I consider, better than mine in terms of content. So he is in the end of November or early December. Um, he's a good guy. That will be his second attempt, I think. And Kim is second or third attempt. I think it's his third. Uh, my second attempt will be December 5th. And so that's coming up. Was that like 40-ish uh, something days? So yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we'll talk about the dedication and how many times it'll, it'll take to pass this this damn thing. So, but definitely a pattern. Most people are like two to three times. Uh, you know, I've met people who've passed it on the eighth or ninth time. So, you know, kind of goes with the territory. Funny crap of the week, recently posted to group study. Hi experts, uh, this guy asked how to copy or move a directory. Uh, yeah, this is to the CCIE list on group study. So I thought that was kind of funny. All right, so let's talk about the people who are thinking about getting CCIE. So for those of you guys who are CCNA or CCNP, uh, well, in CCNA and CCNP, you kind of got it easy. Uh, Cisco handheld you for for quite a bit. They helped you out a lot. Uh, for CCIE, expect no mercy. It's, it's basically, they're very happy to take your 1500 bucks. 
they're happy to take your $350 for the written, $1,500 for the lab. Uh, you're going to have to sacrifice a lot in terms of time, thousands of hours of study. I mean, uh, just to pass the written is going to take you, you know, you're going to have to read several books. It's going to take you a while just to pass the written. And, of course, uh, the lab is going to be in the neighborhood. I don't know how people actually keep track of their hours of labbing. I, I stopped keeping track. It was too tough. But it's it's got to be close to a thousand hours of of labbing or more. Uh, money, you know, you're, it's not just the fees, but also the. I think I had a breakdown in my blog post about the hotel fees and the and the airline fees and the rental car, and it's, it just it adds up to about two thousand to about twenty two hundred dollars per attempt. So if you include all the the lab fees along with all the extra fees, it's about two grand every attempt. Uh, so not only time and money, but health. Uh, you're spending all this time looking at documentation. You're staring at a computer screen sitting down. That's really bad. If you read Roger's uh, blog, he's got a very nice scary post about the dangers of sitting down. He's got all these statistics and stuff like that. So it's a very, very good uh, blog post. Uh, things I had to give up in terms of sacrifice. Uh, I haven't watched TV in like four years. Five years, four years, five years. Now that could be a good thing, you know, because there's not that much on TV other than Doctor Who. But, uh, you know, TV, it's, I haven't watched it, you know, in all these years. Uh, I gave up World of Warcraft. I was a multi-boxer. You know, and anyone who plays World of Warcraft or used to play World of Warcraft knows how tough it is to give that up. So especially as a multi-boxer playing five characters at a time, I was badass. But one day I just said, well, either get my CCIE or, you know, continue playing WoW. You know, so, you know, canceled all those accounts. Uh, the mindset for those who are getting CCIE, it's really interesting. You know, to maintain single-minded determination. It's, it's, that's all you're aiming for for a year or more. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and especially when you put the money down, when you, when you put the credit card down for $1,500 and they take it, they rip it out of your bank account, that's when you're, that's when you're shitting bricks. Yeah, that's, that's when you're really studying. I don't think, I thought I studied a lot before, like in Thailand and before. I was doing six hours of labbing a day in Thailand. But after I put the money down, I was doing 10 hours a day easy. Because, you know, and especially the two weeks before the lab, it's just crazy. You're just, you're scared because you, you thought, uh, you didn't cover this topic, you know, MPLS, multicast, IPv6, all that type of stuff. And, uh, you know, you're just going through all your workbooks constantly. So it's uh, it's pretty interesting how you view things when you're going for the CCIE lab versus CCNP and CCNA. CCNA and CCNP, not too bad. CCIE, you have all that money and all that time invested. It gets pretty, pretty interesting. Any questions so far? So for those of you who are CCNA and CCNP, thinking about going for CCIE, in terms of the mindset, what you have to give up, the sacrifices, the how much money you have to spend, any of that. Oh, no questions at all? Okay, so Michael pasted a link it's at Amazon. Let's check this out. 10,000 hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, Malcolm, what's his name? The guy who wrote Outliers. Gladwell. That guy. One of his books uh, talks about uh, what it takes to become uh, 
awesome, like the top of your game. And he talks about that as well. It's like 2,000 to 10,000 hours of practice. I just remember him as the guy with the crazy hair. Because it's like all over the place. Also about the labbing, I know so the number that's that's given by a lot of people is 800 to 1,000 hours of labbing. I think that's kind of um, not accurate because there's labbing and then there's good labbing. So I know you guys have labbed a lot in your in your studies. You can spend an hour labbing and just kind of go through the motions. And then there's really, really good labbing where you're looking up documentation, where you're you know, scratching your head and going, what the hell's going on here? So I, I think that 800 to 1,000 hours is probably on the low end of actual um, keyboard time. If you do, if you track total keyboard time, it's got to be in the 1,500 hour range for for a successful CCIE uh, for a su successful guy passing CCIE. And I don't know anyone. Uh, out of my circle of friends, um, who has done CCIE with less than two years of studying. Okay, so Anthony has a good uh, question. Uh, he says, I've seen a lot of posts advising to stick to one training advisor. How have you found using ID and Arabic? Okay, so I'm a strong believer of using all the providers, not all, but as many as you can stand. Uh, I started with INE. I bought their workbooks. I bought their blended, uh, they call it like the ended, end to end blended, whatever they call it, solution where you get the workbooks and the videos. And I bought this back in, it was either 2008 or 2009, back when it was like 3000 bucks or something like that. That is special. Uh, now it's like dirt cheap. So I watched all the videos with them first. Uh, I didn't even know about Narbic back then. I did uh, workbook one. I've done workbook one from INE a billion times. <laughs> so, you know, with both this meetup group and others, you know, you know we've, we've been constantly doing those classes. So workbook one, INE, no problem. I've done a couple labs in workbook two, not that much. I'll talk about the full-scale labbing later, but not a lot of full-scale labbing. And then I went with Narbic. I uh, bought his five-day boot camp. And with, when you get his five-day boot camp, you get all his workbooks. So I started going through his workbooks. Went through foundations. And when I went through foundations, I learned a crap ton that I didn't learn in volume one of INE. It was like every, probably... Not every lab, but every other lab, I would go, oh, I never saw this command before in INE, or I never did this show command. Um, so it was filling in the gaps that INE, that, you know, that INE didn't touch, you know. Um, comparing INE to Narbic, all, a lot of you have INE's workbook one, at least. You can kind of tell that uh, even though it's their beginning workbook, that they already expect you to know a lot. They hit you with a, a sledgehammer in the beginning, even though it's a beginning workbook. Narbic's workbook, the foundation workbook, and actually all of his workbooks, kind of lead you by the hand. It's like, okay, let's do this command first, and let's do a show command. Let's do this command, do a show command, this command, show command. So he starts you from the ground up, not assuming that you know anything. So if I had to do it over again, I would have done Narbic first and then INE. But I still would have done two providers. Um, just so you get uh, uh, a look at different topologies and stuff like that. Uh, now, of course, it's going to cost you more money, but you know, the, if you compare the costs... Um, Workbook costs now are dirt cheap. They don't. I don't think they make money on workbooks anymore. I think their money 
is uh, made from boot camps. Actually, I, I know it's made from boot camps. Uh, rack rentals, they don't really make that much money. But, um, but workbooks, you can get them cheap now. So it's not a big deal to get a multi-vendor. So uh, Sheldon has a question. Do you think the opposite would apply as well? INE covers info and Narbic doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they each one has their own strengths. Um, there are certain sections in INE which aren't that great. Uh, there are certain sections in Narbic which could could be better. Uh, so. So that's definitely uh, another reason to get uh, two vendors. So Anthony, does that kind of answer your question about um, using INE and then Narbic? Yeah. And um, even though I'm a big fan of Narbic's bootcamp and I've gone multiple times, I'm sure INE's bootcamp is, is good as well. I, I haven't heard anyone say anything bad about INE's boot camp. I just wish it was uh, a little bit cheaper, but, you know, that's all right. Okay, so let's talk about preparation. I, I did a little bit about this, but uh, let's get into the outline here. So the way I budgeted things, I worked at uh, Panda Restaurant Group. They uh, run Panda Express is their main uh, thing. I worked there for nine months, off and on, and I saved enough money for three attempts. So if you if you take two thousand dollars, you know, the test fee and uh, the hotel and all that, so two thousand times three, that's six thousand bucks. So saved up that, uh, saved up enough money for two months of buffer time, you know, to look for a job. So, you know, 500 bucks or whatever. So that's another thousand bucks. And then uh, money for Thailand, because that's generally where I study. All right. So you figure all that out. I have the Excel spreadsheet. I, I do this several, I do this a couple times a year. So I already know how to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be pulling money from YouTube. So three attempts is what I've got. I could, I could do four, but that's kind of cutting it close on terms of finances, right? So this is what I do. I work, and that's a slow burn. While you're working, you don't you can't really study that much because you're tired, you know, when you get home. Uh, so the studying that you do do during work or while you're working, it is um, just basically stabilizing your your uh, knowledge. You're not really gaining too much or you're slowly gaining, but it's preventing it from dropping. And then when I'm not working, that's when I can devote six to God knows how many hours of study. And that's when you actually make your gains. Uh, that's my experience. This is what I do. This is what we call the high risk single man's study method. So if if you're married, yeah, I don't know if I can recommend you doing this because you have you have responsibility for other people, but this is uh, kind of the way I look at things. Uh, I did Narbix boot camp in March. That's the five day. Uh, a couple months later, I redid a couple days of the five day boot camp. Um, I was working, so I really couldn't do the whole five days again. And then in August, I did the two week boot camp. I upgraded. I paid the difference, fifteen hundred bucks, and I upgraded to the Malaysia uh, boot camp, uh, two week. And so <laughs> it's a lot of boot camps. Uh, but, you know, you pay one fee and you can retake his boot camp as many times. So not a big deal. And then in December, for those of you guys who are interested in Narbic's boot camp, he's actually having two boot camps in Glendale, California, uh, back to back because people are scared about version five and they want to, like, cram into his boot camp. So if you're interested, you know, my chronics and my chronics training, and then sign up for that. Mention router guides, he might give you a discount. Um, hopefully he does. So workbooks, I already mentioned, I need volume one, Narbix foundation, and route switch. Now you'll notice that I, I don't do a lot of full labbing. And there's a reason for that. 
at Narbix Boot Camp, uh, there was a CCIE who just passed. Uh, there's also Narbic. And uh, they basically told me, you know, if you do foundations and advanced routing and switching and just do them over and over and over, that's about 70 to 80% of the lab. And, uh, you know, the students have passed without doing too many mock labs. You know, so you hear some people, all they do is mock labs. I'm kind of opposite. I, I don't do a lot of mock labs. And um, it kind of shows because I actually passed config. I failed troubleshooting and passed config. And this is not doing a lot of mock labs. So I focused on the core. And I focused on doing technologies. So I need volume one, Narbic foundations and Narbic advanced route and switch. I use GNS3 for 95, 90, 95 plus percent of my study. And so all of you know that uh, you know, I made the whole GNS3 relativity drive uh, configs. I did the whole Narbic GNS3 configs. I converted all that shit to GNS3 and uh, I could run it on an Ultrabook and carry it around anywhere. Uh, rack rentals. I did do rack rentals for switches because, you know, you guys know that GNS3 doesn't do switches that much. Um, to practice stuff like uh, spanning tree, uh, mult MST, multi-spanning tree, uh, protected ports, you know, the security stuff, protected ports, private VLANs, VACLs, all that stuff. So I did through CC Online Labs, uh, 30 sessions, 4 hours, 168 bucks, pretty cheap. Uh, it's actually not four hours exactly because uh, the last 30 minutes is, uh, you don't get the last 30 minutes, they shut it off. So it's actually three and a half hours. So I, it's kind of weird. All these, a lot of vendors have this four hour thing, but the 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes, you don't get it. Uh, prices have changed since then. I think it's actually cheaper if you look it up. And a latency from Thailand, not a big deal. So CC Online Labs is somewhere in the west coast of the United States. Not a big deal. Uh, Narbix racks were full. He offers a deal to his boot camp students, uh, $300 a month, 24-7, which is a pretty damn good deal. But it's such a good deal that, uh, you know, they're full. And uh, he's got 24 racks. But if he has a class, then uh, those racks usually aren't, um, aren't available. So other things I use in preparation, Ruhan short notes. Uh, you guys know about Ruhan, right? The routing bits, the best deal in terms of uh, CCIE study. Routing bits. How much does he charge now? Probably 100 something. 98 bucks. You actually get a discount if you mention router guides. I forgot how much it is, but you get a discount. So this is like a hellacious PDF, and uh, it's not protected. So put it on your iPad, put it anywhere, put it on all your laptops. And uh, this is like the thing other than my workbooks. I love this. It's, it's great. I always have this open when, I, when I'm studying. So Ruhan short notes. Um, videos. In the last two months of studying, I didn't watch too many videos. Um, just because you've studied so much, you've done so many workbooks that the videos are kind of, kind of slow. Um, you've you've listened to the videos before. You, you know, the videos are great in the beginning stages when you don't know crap, but in the later stages, it's it's, it's not that great. Yeah, that's my feeling. Yeah, I use VLC. So Sheldon has a good tip: use VLC, and you could do the double playback. Uh, I do the. Uh, I think it's like uh, faster, right? So there is a fast and faster. I do faster and then I do faster again. So it's like three or four times. But even then it's like, you know, it's taking a lot of your time. With video, you have to watch the screen. And, uh, you know, there's a difference between just kind of looking at the video and then completely concentrating on the video. So not too many, uh, not too many videos in the last two months. I used every trick in the book to keep myself awake, to, to keep myself energized. Uh, I would study in the morning in Thailand, so I would wake up around 9 to 10 o'clock, go to Starbucks. That's l the location shifting right here. So with Starbucks, I didn't buy the internet. So Starbucks in Thailand, you have to buy internet. It's not free. And so I would go to Starbucks, 
uh, fire up the laptop, uh, you know, have my my tea, uh, tea or coffee, and my you know cake or whatever, and I would lab for three hours, four hours at Starbucks, no internet, and it's awesome how much you can accomplish without internet. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but if I have a fast internet connection, it's YouTube, uh, you know, Facebook. Uh, Eve online, it, it gets ugly, and then you know five hours later, five hours later, you wonder what the hell happened. So, Starbucks. Uh, then, I would go eat lunch somewhere. I would go back to Starbucks to study even more, and eat dinner, and then go back to the condo or wherever and lab more, you know, some more. And uh, since the condo had internet, I found out that at the condo, I didn't do that much studying you know, it's, you know it's labbing here and there but really i got all my studying done in the daylight hours and then at night uh, god knows what else i did all right um exercise important all this studying is going to hurt you health wise um i noticed i don't know if any of you guys have also noticed in in your ccie studies um text and in books they start getting blurry you're staring at all this crap for all these hours a day, and uh, I think my vision has just gotten horribly worse since I do it, started doing this studying. Uh, the weight gain from all the sitting. Uh, so, yeah, what I started doing is in the afternoon, when it's a little bit cooler, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., I'll do a fast walk, uh, Pattaya, Thailand. It's got a nice, uh, not a nice beach, but the path you can walk along. And uh, I started jogging, and that definitely helps a lot. Um, naps, you got to take naps. Um, you're, you're spending all this brain power in the daytime and it just it's going to hit you around uh, 3 p.m. I learned this trick from a pilot. Before you take your nap, drink some coffee. And uh, what happens is the coffee hits you after you wake up from the nap. And I was like, dude, genius. That's awesome. So, uh, of course, it took me 39 years to figure that one out, but uh, yeah, yeah, so it doesn't have to be coffee. It could be tea or a five-hour energy drink or whatever, but uh, before you take your nap, bust out with some coffee, and when you wake up from the nap, you're ready to go, ready to study. Uh, the laptop, so we had a boot camp back in April in Thailand, and we learned a couple lessons. One lesson is can't always get near a power outlet which kind of sucks when you have a big monster Asus gaming laptop that only lasts about 45 minutes before it dies great laptop horrible battery life uh, so this time learning from that experience Sony Via Pro 13 it's ultrabook it's Core i7 but the battery life is seven hours and I've got the external uh, battery for it. it gives me another seven hours so 14 hours of battery life. Now, if I'm cranking GNS3 full brightness, all that stuff, uh, it's it's less. It's about 10 hours, but you know, no big deal. So I still carry the the power pack or the AC adapter, but if I don't find an outlet, no big deal. So if you're going to do this thing where you're going to go out to study, go to Starbucks and stuff like that, just keep in mind that you can't always get an outlet, even in the U.S. or you know, if you're in a first world country. Um, you know, so you're going to need to get a laptop that's portable, light, and has long battery life, but still powerful. So these Core i7 Ultrabooks that they're having out now are, are pretty decent. They're not too bad. And I looked at it as an investment. This, uh, the Sony Vio laptop that I have, it's exclusively for, for uh, well, not exclusively. I do do some other things, but pretty much this is my labbing laptop if i want a lab that's where i go is that that ultra book and i replicated the testing environment as much as possible so i normally type dvorak format i switch back to qwerty because uh the lab you have to use qwerty i asked cisco i emailed them the lab manager they said nope no exceptions the only way they could get me uh, a dvorak layout is if I came up with a doctor's note saying if I didn't type Dvorak, it would be a health uh, hazard or something like that. So, you know, that's unethical. You know, I'm not going to get a doctor to say that. So I switched back to QWERTY, 
and I purchased a desktop keyboard because all my friends, not all, but two of my friends who recently failed the lab, they said that the keyboard at the lab screwed them up because they practiced with a laptop keyboard. They did all their practice on a laptop. And you guys know when you go from a laptop keyboard to a desktop keyboard is different. So a lot of mistakes, right? So I went with the desktop keyboard, connected it to, to, to the laptop. And I kept everything on a single screen. So I didn't use multiple screens. I had an extra monitor, but I didn't use it on purpose. So a single screen. Because the lab is a single screen. And used hackpad, as you see here, for a lot of my note taking. Hackpad, really, for taking notes and keeping things organized, it's pretty badass. So Anthony has a question, was it worthwhile adding aliases? Is there access to notepads? So we'll talk about that, but I can answer that. Um, we're getting into the venue and the interface. So let me just add that here, aliases and uh, notepad. Yeah, so we'll talk about that when we get down here. Any questions about the preparation? Any of that preparation stuff, the budgeting, uh, you know, the rack rentals, the GNS3, some of the tricks, the laptop, stuff like that. Okay, so we have uh, two questions, uh, one from Tony and one from Douglas. I'll do Douglas's question first and then Tony's. We'll kind of work upwards. Uh, so Douglas has a question, why did you decide to train overseas? So. Uh, I have a couple of blog posts about this. So there are uh, there are other boot camps overseas. Uh, there is a, a boot camp in Thailand. The reason I decided to do Narbix boot camp in Malaysia is, uh, well, I was going to Thailand anyways afterwards. So Malaysia is just a hop away. Uh, also, it's like it's a nice vacation. If I'm going to do a boot camp, might as well do it in in a exotic place. Uh, as far as Thailand is concerned. If you add up the costs for a long-term trip in Thailand, it actually turns out to be cheaper, even with airfare, for me versus uh, United States, staying in the U.S. So if I'm going to study for three months for CCIE, you know, do I want to study in the U.S. or do I want to study in, in Thailand if the cost is relatively the same? Uh, the choice is easy for me. I'm going to, I'm going to Thailand. Uh, for a couple reasons, um, food. Sheldon knows uh, Thailand kicks ass over the U.S. for food. It's cheap. Uh, you can get food at any time. So uh, when you're studying and it's two in the morning and you want food, if you're in the U.S., what choices do you have in the U.S.? You have you got uh, Denny's, Taco Bell, Del Taco. You go to McDonald's, right? But you have pretty crappy choices in the U.S. At, at in the morning. In Thailand, in the morning, you want food. Uh, everything's still pretty much open, so you get, you know, good food at 2 a.m. Um, uh, also, the condo I stay at in Thailand, next door is a mall. So I just roll out of bed and there's, you know, I can get everything. You know, Starbucks is next door, basically. Uh, so, so there's that. Uh, I pick the condo rental because it's cheap. It's really cheap, especially if you do three months. Um, and I try to pick condos that have nice views and balconies, even though it costs a little bit more, because I do a lot of the labbing uh, while I'm in the condo on the balcony. You know, might as well look at the, you know, the ocean and stuff like that while uh, while you're doing all this. Um, another reason is. Uh, it gets kind of depressing doing all this labbing. I, I don't know about you guys, but it, at at the several hundred hour mark of labbing, after you've gone through all these workbooks multiple times, and you go, shit, is it worth it? You know, you, you get all this self-doubt, and uh, yeah, that also comes in the mindset. You have these ups and downs of, uh, of, of CCIE studying. Some days you feel really good, and other days you feel like crap. So, uh, you know, if you know that your studying is going to suck, uh, you might as well be in a, a, 
a nice place while it sucks you know so be in an environment where it's fun and lively and stuff like that uh, you, you know being stuck at home for three months studying wasn't very uh, appealing for me so that's why I decided to do my studying overseas and rack rentals you just go you have an internet connection and then and, and it's all right uh, GNS3 I'm fully portable it doesn't have to be Thailand uh, we do have one member uh, he, he he hasn't gone to a meeting, but he's going for a CCIE. He's doing his studying in Guadalajara. So he's American, went to Guadalajara. It's cheap, you know, it's got electricity, there's food, you know. Obviously, Guadalajara's got Mexican food, probably beats Chipotle. So, uh, you know, there's there's that. It could be Costa Rica, it could be Africa, maybe not Africa, but, you know, there's ways to do this, right? Uh, so hopefully, Douglas, that answers your question about deciding to, to train overseas. It's just personal choice. You know, it's, if, if the cost is the same, man, I'm, I'm going overseas. Yeah. In fact, uh, right after my lab attempt on December 5th, I'm going overseas. Because whether I pass or fail, screw it. I'm going overseas for another month, and then I'm coming back. So Tony's question, uh, he says, uh, earlier in your studies... Did you find it easier to study one topic at a time from novice to complete understanding? Or did you jump from topic to topic, uh, gradually gaining experience on multiple topics at a time? So early on, stick to one topic. What I tried to do is stick to one topic for three days straight. So one topic for three days straight, uh, whether it's BGP, or OSPF, or whatever, three days. Uh, why three days? First day, shock to your system. You don't know what the hell's going on, right? Uh, I know when I first started doing MPLS, it was like, the hell is this? <laughs> so first day, you don't know what's going on. You just kind of like fumble through it. Uh, second day of labbing, you know, okay, a little bit, a little bit better. Third day, it's it's not too bad. Third day should be should be okay. So the reason I keep it three days per topic is because you get bored. Yeah, after three days, yeah, let's, let's move on to something interesting. So that's how I did it in the beginning. And the workbooks, actually all the workbooks, they're kind of designed to, the tasks are kind of last three days. Like, uh, so if you look at INE's workbook one, and you look at the OSPF section, it takes you about three days to get through it, you know, working at a, a decent clip, right? Uh, BGP maybe four days, but you know most of the sections in all of the workbooks from all the vendors, if if you cranked it out, you know three days you could do it. Uh, later on, uh, I I still don't I still keep to the three day schedule, you know so multicast I'll do three days of multicast straight, uh, MPLS I'll do three days of MPLS straight. I don't like to move uh, bounce around too much. Uh, the bouncing around comes from when you do your mock labs and your practice labs, because then they hit you with everything and there's dependencies, uh, which I will talk about uh, in the config section. That's that's where you have to watch out. Okay, any other questions in this uh, preparation step here? All right, so if you think about questions later on about previous sections, no worries, just type it in there and uh, we'll answer it when we, uh, when we finish up uh, a section or, or at the end. So not a big deal. All right, let's talk about the venue. Uh, this is in San Jose. That freaking room is a dungeon. There's no windows, it's depressing. The lighting's okay, but uh, it's a big square. There's a big table in the middle. All the computers, all the, the work workstations, the desks are on the sides of the room. We're all basically on the square, the outside of the square. Uh, the, there are three routing and switching desks at San Jose. Uh, all the other testing centers, it's two or three, or I think it's two or three, forget. Um, 
but they all have multiple routing and switching ones. Uh, they all have, or most of them should have multiple voice ones. Um, that day I was the only route and switch guy. Everyone else was like service provider and voice, and there was a wireless guy, and there was a data center guy. Uh, the voice guys, I hate them. want to kill them because uh, the voice guys make their phones ring. So thankfully, the voice guys are on the other side, the opposite end of the room. So it's not too bad. Just remember to bring your um, earplugs. So drinks allowed at your desk, no problem. Uh, earplugs, bring your earplugs. Uh, no questions asked. They have to be earplugs. They can't be ear muffs. So you can't bring like your Beats headphones or anything like that. So just plain vanilla earplugs. Uh, the big center table, everyone just puts all their crap, their wallets. Now, actually, you don't need to put your wallet on the center table. It's not good. But like keys, phones, all that stuff. You know. So the center table, put your crap there. And then um, I bought a whole bunch of candy bars and stuff. And uh, I bought a four pack of Red Bull and I bought uh, four five hour energy. I, I, came, I came ready. And uh, you know, every couple, every 30 minutes I would get up and then go to the center table and grab my, my crap and then uh, drink it and then sit back down. Uh, they keep the door unlocked so one person at a time can go out to the bathroom and uh, she watched the the proctor watches you like a hawk. It's pretty crazy. And uh, you cannot leave the building, even during lunch. If you leave the building, I don't know what happens to you. Like ninjas come after you or whatever. But uh, they explicitly said you cannot leave the building. You have to eat lunch in a group. You cannot eat lunch by yourself. Um, it is pretty crazy when you. When you finish the morning session at like 12 something or whatever, we, you basically march to the cafe in a group and uh, you, get, you get your food as a group and you sit down as a group and uh, you know everyone's pissed off and sad because they knew, everyone knows they failed. We, we all failed. Everyone in that room on that day failed. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty interesting experience the first time pretty interesting to see and uh, I was talking with one of the voice guys and uh, his quote was interesting he said that was his third time so the voice guy said the first time I got there if you gave me 24 hours I still couldn't have finished second time I got there you could have given me 12 hours I wouldn't have finished this time, I'm still going to fail, but yeah, you know, I'm close, but I'm still going to fail. So that's the voice guy. So Douglas says, in Raleigh, they bring in food and everyone crowds in a small room and eats. Ooh. Really? He, there's no uh, cafe? Yeah, uh, okay. Oh man, that kind of sucks. I guess it's alright. They bring your food. But... So, for those eight hours, the two hour troubleshooting and the six hour config, when it started, I popped in my headphone, my uh, earplugs, and I just tuned everything out. You know, there was the clock in front of me. At San Jose, the clock is right above the routing and switching um, desks. That's pretty. That's awesome for us. For you know, when you need to keep track of time, that clock is the reference clock. No other clocks count. So when they start and stop the times, and when they go to lunch, that clock is like the god clock for for keeping track. And uh, that day, yeah, the proctor seemed nice, but I didn't. I didn't ask any questions. I I didn't feel any any real need to. Any questions about the venue? You know, how things were laid out, you know, the, the policies and stuff like that.
Okay, let's talk about the interface. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so Dell 24 inch monitor. It's a big monitor. Uh, I don't know the exact resolution. It's probably, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's got to be at least 1920 by 1080, but um, who knows? Uh, you can't, I, I didn't bother looking. So it's big screen. It's a single screen. Uh, all the putty windows are separate windows. So if you open up three putty windows, they're not tabbed or anything. There's no super putty. There's no secure CRT. Uh, it's automatically set to always on top. So usually this would be okay, but the thing is you're juggling multiple windows with diagrams and crap like that. So in your config section, you've got diagrams, your, your overall diagram. Uh, you've got your diagram for layer two. You've got your diagram for MPLS. You know, there's a diagram for everything, IGP, all that good stuff. And it becomes this weird game of Tetris or Jenga or whatever you want to call it, moving all your... Uh, your putty windows around your diagrams and putty windows and stuff like that so you, know, you you can't really have more than three terminal windows open at any one time now the cool thing is um, to open a terminal session it's a pretty slick interface it's a picture it's a, you get the diagram in a browser window you just double click and the thing opens so that part's cool uh, so it really cuts down on uh, you know going on the wrong the wrong router and uh, configuring stuff. Uh, so so you get used to it, but man, the first the first attempt, it's like Jesus, like you know. So if you practice with two monitors, not so good. You're you're used to all this space. Um, I hear this from a lot of people. Once you get within two months. One to two months of the lab, just do everything on one monitor. It's it, it sucks, but you just have to get get used to it. Uh, the documentation CD you do have access to it. You just go to the bottom. Uh, I think it's the bottom left hand corner. There's a link to it. Click on it, and um, <laughs> the first link I clicked in the documentation CD, CD or the documentation site, uh, it came up with this big like the red letters denied. You know you denied due to policy on the gray list or whatever it said. I was like, ah, shit. And then, so you can't go everywhere in the documentation CD, but, uh, you know, you have the command reference, and you, you can go to, to most things. Uh, so, now, Anthony has had a question for aliases and notepad. You do have access to notepad. Uh, aliases, I did not make any aliases. Probably would have, could have helped. Uh, but no, I, di I didn't make any aliases. What I did do is uh, you get two pieces of scratch paper. You can ask for more. Those pieces of scratch paper, they're like serial numbered at the top. So it says Humphrey Chung, page one of two. Humphrey Chung, page two of two. Uh, I don't know what happens when you ask for more pages. Do, do they like have to renumber the first two or whatever? But at the beginning of the lab, I wrote some notes to myself. I like um, remember to save. Duh, right? Remember to save. Uh, stop debugs. I, I wrote. I can't remember all the things I did, but uh, you know, reminders to myself. Um, but you know, that was with the sheets of paper. You could do it. With, you could do it with Notepad. You could save your Notepad things. Um, one thing I did do with Notepad is uh, before I made changes in troubleshooting. I would copy uh, the relevant configs from the routers into Notepad just in case, just to, uh, to have a point of reference, change control or whatever. So um, I did do that. Oh, I did use Notepad for uh, BGP configuration and IPv6 configuration. Because as you guys know, if you've practiced IPv6 with Frame Relay, freaking hell, man, that's a lot of typing. That's, that's ugly all the frame relay map IPv6, you know, FE80, all that stuff. And then the, the global address. So that gets ugly. BGP config gets ugly. It could take a long, long time. Um, QoS, Notepad helps a lot with QoS because those class maps and policy maps just get hellacious. So Notepad does come in handy. Uh, you have access to calculator. I didn't use it. Uh, I didn't use calculator. There was really no no uh, 
need to use calculator. I'm Asian. No, there there wasn't anything requiring any calculation. So, any questions about the interface? Yeah, if you're, Sheldon has a good point. If you're used to be the tabbed interface of like Super Putty or Secure CRT, and you get it, and you don't practice with separate windows, uh, this this would hurt. This would be a, uh, I won't say a deal breaker, but this this would hurt. And and really the first time, see I'm I'm fortunate because I get to see this. I got to see this interface at uh, Cisco Live two years ago uh, with INE's little troubleshooting thing. It was very similar. And I got to see this as part of my assessment lab for Narvik's bootcamp because Narvik's part of 360 and he does the official Cisco stuff, right? So I've seen this interface twice. But even still, since it was my first attempt, uh, the first... I would say the first 10 minutes, you're basically going, what the hell's going on? Like, oh, I'm in the lab, 1500 bucks, right? So your first five to 10 minutes, you're just kind of like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, so, you know, that's why a lot of people fail their first time is you're just like, wow, this is new. So Michael has a question. Did the putty window title have the router name or something obscure? It's the router name. You, you, it, it matches. So there's no no confusion with the the terminal window. And even though the putty windows are always on top, um, I'm sure I right clicked. I, there's a checkbox for that. I'm, I'm sure you could probably uncheck it and and have it go under your diagrams. I did not try Alt Tab. Um, it probably would work. Let me give you guys an opinion about why it's a single monitor. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation of whether uh, Cisco records your, your sessions. I think they do. And I think that's the main reason why there's not a second monitor, because as soon as you add a second monitor, you make screen recording kind of uh, funky. Um, we know for sure that, absolutely sure, that your keystrokes are logged. And that's one of the reasons why you can't go to Dvorak, because they're hardware logging the, the keystrokes. Uh, so we know that for sure. We're pretty sure that they're recording the screen um, because they're able to play back your lab when uh, when you have a uh, what you call it when you demand a, a regrade they can play back your lab uh, also from talking to Narbic uh, Narbic gives the story in his uh, boot camp uh, he and his friend passed uh, it was either service provider or, or the security one on the same day and uh, some idiot out there accused Narbic of, of cheating so Sis uh, he went to Cisco's headquarters it was for something else and they pulled him aside and they said hey uh, some guy accused you of cheating and uh, he was like what you know, and they're like we we know you didn't cheat but uh, we replayed your lab. I guess either they told him exactly how it went or he saw it or whatever, but they're able to play back everything keystroke by keystroke and mouse move uh, from, your, from your lab. So that's my opinion of why you're stuck on a single screen. Uh, so in the bottom right-hand corner is a VNC icon, so they obviously have remote control if they want to. Um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that big of a stretch to think that they might be peeking into your your session while you're labbing, you know, just for the hell of it, right? But uh, you know, it's, it's definitely technically feasible. It's not a big deal. Okay, any any questions about interface and the no sheets of 
note paper, um, the screen, the documentation CD. I, I didn't use doc, documentation CD too much. And I felt, I looked up two things on the documentation CD, but I felt in config that if you have to look up more than two things in the doc CD, you're probably dead. Uh, troubleshooting, I did not have, uh, there's no time to look up documentation in troubleshooting. You're just, you're just going nuts in troubleshooting. Okay, uh, video, you can watch that later. Troubleshooting, yeah, this is where I died. So, I got my score report, and uh, pretty much expected. Uh, I got five tickets out of ten. Not not bad on the first attempt, I, I think. Um, ten tickets in total, all were two-pointers. Now, this is my lab. Whatever you get in your lab is whatever, right? Very, very large topology. Three dozen devices. And the myth is, so you've heard the myth that they can't really test you in troubleshooting. That's a myth. I'm not going to break NDA, but they can test you in switching in troubleshooting. They have to pick and choose their topics, but they could do it. There's switches in there. Um, there are servers. There's things emulating PCs. So there's a big... Let me think about this. How can I put this? It's a big topology. And there's a big blob in the center that kills people. It's a giant monster. <laughs> so, you know, if you're if you're not used to dealing with large topologies, that can be kind of uh, nerve wracking. Um, so, so yeah. My strategy was do the stuff on the edges. So there's like networks hanging off the edges. You know, three, four, or five routers. I did what I thought were the easy tickets first, and then. I tackled the blob, the, the tickets that required messing in the MPLS cloud. Um, no hints in the ticket name. It just says, ticket one, this guy cannot ping that guy, or this guy cannot tell that to that guy, or do this or do that. So a lot of you guys in uh, doing INE's workbook one, Let's say you're doing uh, OSPF, right? And the task says virtual links. So you know you have to use a virtual link because the task, the, the title tells you. I know I know Sheldon and I talked about it. I was like, dude, the, the damn title of the task tells you what to do, right? Uh, in troubleshooting ticket one, like R1 cannot ping R30. It's like, oh, okay. Like, what do I do now? Right, so, so, uh, it, it, if you're not used to that, then uh, then be prepared. So no hints, but um, not not as bad as I thought it could be. Uh, now the topics are all over the place. It's not all concentrating core. It's everywhere. So I think what they did is they picked one topic from every section of the every major section. So ten questions, they spread it all over the place. So expect to get five of your stuff in advanced topics and five of your stuff in core topics. Um, not as many restrictions as I expected. Stuff like uh, you can only fix this by going on this router, or don't touch this router, or don't do that. There were some questions, but not not as many. Most of the fixes were dumb. So it's very easy to think too high level, to overthink troubleshooting. It's, it's. I think I explained it in the blog post, this idiot CCN, sorry CCNA guys, but this, you had this network working, you went on vacation, this new CCNA or MCSE came in and he fucked it up. And he just walked away. Things are missing, things are mistyped, they're flipped. You know, stuff like that. That's about three to five tickets. Easy. Uh, three tickets were moderate. They're like multiple fault tickets. You have to fix this router and that router. Or it's multiple things on one router. And then two tickets were like, Jesus Christ, what the hell? I, I have no idea, right? So uh, so I, I think that's kind of their, their thing. Since you have to get 80%, if you get the moderate ones and all the brain dead ones, then you pass. 
Um, but you really need to get at least one of the, the crazy ones to, to have a, a decent chance. Warning, uh, a big warning to you guys, configurations in the blind. What that means is you you don't do a show access list before you fire in an access list, so you override it. Where this can really hurt you is uh, with um, OSPF. So you fire in a router OSPF 1 and whatever, right? Imagine if they used OSPF 100 as the global OSPF table and OSPF 1 was their VRF for, you know, customer A or whatever. You just had, you just blew, you know, potentially you could blow away a VRF. So you know, always get in a habit of show access list or show this or show that before you fire in a, a config. Uh, now, if you do blow it up, not a big deal because uh, in the upper right hand corner, you can click on manage devices and uh, you can reset a device. It's a virtual device, so it's no big deal. It's IOU or whatever they call it. So uh, you can always do that. But configurations in the blind, meaning don't fire in a config without doing a show command first. Uh, trying to remember problems from ticket to ticket. You want to skip a ticket if you're getting stuck. So I was looking at the clock, and if it, it hit the 10-minute mark, I would skip a ticket. Uh, you're not going to remember from ticket to ticket, trust me. So what I didn't do, which was what I should have done, is I, I made a chart. I did make a chart, you know, 1, one through 10, and I did a check mark if I got the ticket, and I put a question mark if I didn't get the ticket. What I should have done, in addition, is put like, uh, you know, this seems like a, uh, 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 let me pick a topic that wasn't on troubleshooting. Uh, uh, seems like a, a problem with the route map. Right? That way, when you go back to ticket, it's like, oh, okay, right, route map thing, right? Because if, if you got stuck on ticket three and you skip, 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 you're on ticket eight, and then you cycle back to ticket three, you don't remember it. Trust me, it's too stressful. You don't remember crap from ticket to ticket. So looking back at it, now that I, I failed it once, i &E has a uh, troubleshooting seminar that they did that was free. If you have the all access pass or the ATC pass or whatever, uh, you should be able to find it. Now, most of it's kind of, it's okay, it's not that great. It's basically them going through tickets but it's the first or second section of it where they have a really, really awesome tip that would have saved my ass. I, I would have passed. I, I shouldn't say I would have, but I would have had a much better chance of passing if I would have done their tip, and that's the their mega show command. Right, this mega show command is uh, you do this when you start the ticket on the relevant routers. So show IP protocol summary show run pipe i access list class map you know all this crap like shut down you know so do that that's to find if any access list is messing with stuff because you know remember a lot of this is uh is evil like not evil but uh stupid stuff right the show ip protocol summary tells you the protocol sometimes the protocol may be missing sometimes it has a wrong um name or not name but number right supposed to be EIGP 100, but it's EIGP 1, let's say. And the ping 255, that's, uh, what you know, if it fails, you know that, oh, shit, next top reachability, got to fix that. All right. So I should have typed this into Notepad, and then it would be ready to paste in into whatever routers I'm currently working on. That's their mega show command. Of course, the show command, you can add other stuff to it, but that's that's kind of the gist of it, right? So three, uh, two show commands and a ping. And a tip from Mike Marvell. I met him at Cisco Live uh, two years ago. It's actually last year. Uh, he is CCIE 35642. So every year at Cisco Live, there is a uh, dinner or a meeting, dinner and meeting, of uh, CCIE candidates, 
current CCIEs and potential CCIEs. It's a good thing to go to. If you go to Cisco Live, this is a very, very good thing to go to. And we basically uh, meet and we talk the shit, right? Um, he had just passed his lab after the eighth or ninth attempt last year. So he's a, he's a trooper. He passed at the mobile lab at Cisco Live. Uh, so he emailed me uh, yesterday and he said, well, the way I did it when I finally passed is two months, for two months before the lab, all he did was troubleshooting labs. That's all he did. No config labs, no mock labs, just two months of straight troubleshooting labs. So I don't have two months. I have like a month and a half. So it's kind of what I'll be doing in addition to other things. And if you fail troubleshooting, don't rage quit. Don't walk out. People do. The proctor told me this. They just walk out. Uh, you know, do the config, right? It's free. You're there anyways, right? Just do the config. I'm glad I did. I'm very glad I, I could have walked out. I didn't really feel like doing config, which helped. Uh, but if if you know you failed troubleshooting, don't walk out. Continue on, finish the rest of the day. Be a man about it. Just, you know, I, I looked at config as a free, uh, like, boot camp. So let's see. Sheldon has a comment. Sounds very similar to CCNP T-Shoot, but with a bigger batter topology. Yeah, more expensive too. I did not use tickle scripts. I probably should have. Uh, it would have helped me in uh, config. Uh, tickle scripts would not have helped me in um, in troubleshooting. The thing to do in troubleshooting, uh, it's pings, it's trace routes, trace routes from both sides to see where they converge. Show IP Ceph. Show IP Ceph is, uh, that will save your ass in troubleshooting. <laughs> Definitely. But tickle scripts for, you know, pinging a whole bunch of stuff? No, no. Um, also, the way they have their tickets arranged, they don't really interfere with each other. And, and what I mean is no cascading point loss. If you don't get one ticket, it probably doesn't affect, probably won't affect the other nine tickets. But if you if you severely, if you really screw up, like, like I don't know, you MCSE it, uh, you could potentially like destroy all your tickets, but it's it's hard to do. So Michael has a question. Where do you find two months of troubleshooting labs? That's a good question. Um, Cisco 360 has a, a uh, block of labs that you can buy. Now, it's a block of 35, 40, 36 labs, whatever it is. Um, it's like 700 bucks. Now, the first 25 are older style labs without troubleshooting, but the last set of nine or so have a troubleshooting section. Um, so that that is something good to look at. Uh, you could do INE, uh, INE's uh, troubleshooting mock labs for two months. So you just, now what I'm doing, the way I'm doing it is uh, I'm taking it kind of like from my early years of uh, playing professional chess. I used to play U.S. Chess Federation chess tournaments. And I found the way to get good at chess is to make chess problems. So, you know, to kind of make these weird puzzles. So that's kind of the direction I'm taking it is I'm going through these workbooks again. I'm finishing each task. I'm saving it. And then I'm, I'm screwing around with different things to uh, make a... Uh, a troubleshooting, uh, you know, ticket, and it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, here's route reflectors, and for some reason, one of the routers has the same um, cluster ID, router ID, right? So, you know, stuff, stuff like that. So making my own troubleshooting tickets. We'll talk about that later, but that's kind of the way I'm approaching it. In addition to doing some troubleshooting labs, because it. it you know, I'm not going to lie. It it hurts to uh, to fail your your lab in the first two hours. It's it's uh, not a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. So, any questions about troubleshooting?
All right, so Michael has a question. Do you get immediate feedback on the tickets? Now, by immediate, uh, are you asking whether you got the ticket right? You don't, so you don't know whether you pass troubleshooting until you get your score report. Now, here, here's the thing about your score report. Well, after troubleshooting finishes, uh, you, you will know whether you passed or not. I mean, you'll know. Uh, but at the end of the day, so we at San Jose, you get out at 5.15 p.m. I got my score report. I, I knew I failed because uh, I failed troubleshooting. If, if you screw up bad, so if you screw up bad or you pass awesomely, so the, the two extremes, you're, you're a complete badass or you, you completely foobarred it, you will get your score report within an hour and a half. Because the scripts run through it, they basically said, dude, this guy sucks, right? So I got my score report pretty damn quick. Uh, let me look it up. Hold on. Hold on. One second here. October 15th. Lab score report. All right, let's see what we got here. <laughs> okay, there it is. Uh, let's see. You probably can't see this. Let me... Uh, 1845, 645. So that's an uh, hour and a half. All right, that's, all, that's right on the money. So if you get your score report uh, before dinner... You either failed or you pa or you either failed really bad or you passed. So if if it uh, takes longer, then what's probably happening is the scripts went through. You're kind of close, and now they're checking by hand, like an actual human being is is looking at it. Any other questions about troubleshooting? All right, if you guys think of anything, just uh, ask at the end. Let's go into configuration. Easier than I expected, uh, because I, I knew I failed troubleshooting, so I, di I didn't care. So I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to do this. And uh, a funny thing happened. Uh, I pretty much damn near finished the whole thing. I left out, uh, I didn't do, I probably can't say that. Uh, I guess I can say that. You know, multicasting, because we know every lab's going to have multicasting, so probably not breaking NDA on that. And every lab's going to have QoS. So I was like, eh, yeah, didn't do those two. But, but uh, yeah, I, I was so relaxed, I didn't care. So I just went through configuration. Like, uh, like, I just drank a bottle of wine or whatever. Um, if you like doing a lot of the mock labs, like Ionis mock labs, their mock labs are tougher than config. I thought the config was easier than most of the mock labs I've done. So workbook two, you do the level nine or eight or whatever it is in workbook two or INE. It's tougher than the real thing. Uh, not that many dirty tricks. I mean, it's basically... What it is, it's a speed test. Configure a whole mountain of shit in six hours. That's about it. It's pretty, it's it's straightforward. Um, muscle memory, oh my god, OSPF. How many of you are used to typing router OSPF1? If you're used to typing router OSPF1, like I am, stop it. Don't do it. Stop it right now. Because this is going to hurt you in the lab. Because it's you know you're going to get to that OSPF section, and you're going to find that interfaces aren't coming up, neighborships aren't forming, 
and you look back at your config, and son of a bitch, you meant to type in OSPF 100, but you, like, your fingers typed in o router OSPF 1. I know you think you're not going to do that, but it happens. Uh, the loopbacks, you know, if you're used to typing in 1.1.1.1, you, you'd be amazed. Like, you just, you fling it in there, and you, you don't even consciously remember that you've typed that in, so. Muscle memory sucks, you know. Mix it up a bit. Don't do OSPF1. Uh, also, OSPF1 might be your VRF OSPF. So you type in OSPF1, you've hurt yourself big time. Um, configurations in the blind, I talked about that before. Always do show commands before you do it. Topics everywhere. If, if there's a topic you don't like, I don't like multicast. I, I don't like... Uh, I don't like... QoS. Multicast and QoS, I don't like. Uh, they will find your weakness and they will hit you with it. Uh, they will hit all topics. Like a 12K shit is just going to be a blast. They're going to hit you with it. Um, study everything. Uh, now, the way this kind of works, I, I'm pretty sure I could talk. It's not NDA or anything. The test is divided into five. The config is divided into five sections. At least mine was. Layer 2, Layer 3, Multicast, um, it's like IP services or whatever, and then uh, Optimization or whatever it was called. Now they throw the advanced topics like QoS and security and all that in the last two sections. Uh, multicast was very small. Not too much. It's okay. Um, IPv6, IPv6, BGP, all redistribution, that's all mixed in with layer 3. Right? That's just uh, Hail Mary. You know, two points, three points, two points, three points, four points here and there. Um, some of the two pointers require a lot of typing, like goddamn, like 30 lines of typing or whatever. Uh, so, the the points versus length of typing does not match. So you could have a, a question where uh, uh, two lines fix it, or two lines do it, and it's a three-pointer. You could have another one where it's like 30, 40 lines, and it's a two-pointer. So what I think it is, is they do the points for uh, perceived difficulty and not amount of typing. So time management definitely comes into play. You're just typing away. It's it's crazy. IPv6, BGP, notepad, you're going to get bogged down in that. And it's basically a mad sprint for six hours. It's, just, it's, just, you know, it's a lot of config. It's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, but it's a lot. And the reality is, you know, really, the CCIE lab is not realistic. It's, it's, uh, you will never design a network this way. So just, all you have to do, it's simple. Follow directions. And if you're fast enough and you know your stuff, that's it. You know, they'll tell you to do this and you're probably thinking, well, I'd never do that. But, you know, just do it. Let's see, so Anthony has a comment. Uh, one of Jeremy Chara's CBT nuggets says there is a value in sitting in an exam even though you know you're going to fail just to gain the experience of the benchmark. Do you feel you got your money's worth in your first lab attempt? Yes, because I knew that chances are pretty slim that I would pass on the first attempt. Now, I know you guys have seen me, you know, you've been to most of the meetups, you've watched the YouTube videos, you know how fast I can configure even while talking. I'm all right. And I failed. And so I know some of you are probably going to be thinking, well, shit, if Humphrey failed, like, how am I going to do it, right? Um, but I, I knew it was, it was slim. Supposedly 10% or whatever, right? It's a different blog post or whatever. But I think what it is is the, the first time pass is 5 to 10%. And think about it, the people going for CCIE lab generally are not dumb people, right? 
So the, generally the people going for a CCIE lab sitting in that room are the top people in their companies, right? Usually, right? So they're the only ones crazy enough to do this. So, you know, the top people are all getting killed on the first attempt. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I knew it was going to be slim. Um, it's definitely, it's, it's paying your dues. I, I think of it as it's another written test. Your written test is a bullshit thing, right? 350 bucks. It's just to get you into the lab. Right? The first attempt is kind of the same thing. It's like, you, you just, you have to do it. I put it off for so long. I should have done this earlier. Um, now I look back at it. I should have taken the first attempt earlier because it kicks your ass. After you fail, it kicks your ass to study even more to actually get it. So that's the way I look at it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It hurts to lose. It hurts to think that you know, it's $2,000 down the drain. But if you think of it as it's just rolled into the total cost, you know, it's a little bit better. But not going to lie, it, uh, you know, no one wants to spend that mu amount of money and, and not pass. But the odds are, are stacked against you, against you. You can pass on the first time. you got to be really damn good. But the first time, you just, you don't know really what's going to hurt, what's going to hit you. You know, it's, it's all new to you. So, and it doesn't, I probably laugh more than a majority of people going for their first time. You know, and I had more resources, and I still failed. So that kind of shows you, uh, you know, what how difficult it's going to be. But yeah, I, I feel I got my money's worth. Um, yeah, I think Sheldon said in the in the mailing list something like uh, that's like a boot camp in itself. You know, that's like a lesson in itself. And uh, yeah, yeah, the the lesson I learned, actually, the main lesson I learned in this first attempt is, since I passed config, I can pass it, right? All I have to do is pass troubleshooting. And I got 5 out of 10 in troubleshooting on my first attempt. I'm sure there's people who go on their first attempt, they get, like, no trouble. Well, maybe not no, but, you know, like one ticket, two tickets. So the feeling that I've gone through their lab and, uh, you know, I could pass one part of it and I could probably pass the other part with a little bit of studying. Not a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> a lot more studying. Um, and what's cool is supposedly, if you listen to the rumors, the first attempt, they give you the hardest lab, the hardest troubleshooting, the hardest config on your first attempt. So it's all downhill from, from here, right? That's the rumor. Right? Yeah, but I just look at it as, well, it, it was probably going to happen. Um, I actually scheduled a couple days up in San Jose, just on the, if I did pass, then I I would I brought my suit, I was going to look for a job, I was going to walk into some companies and stuff like that, but it didn't happen, so I just hung out for, uh, for about four more days in uh, Silicon Valley. Just another vacation. Okay, any questions about configuration? We're almost done. We're almost to the end. Yeah, not too much. Okay. Dealing with failure. Okay, so here's here's what I would change. Or here's what I'm doing from now on. Concentrate more on advanced topics. Uh, I think... My main problem was, in my studies, I kept in the core a little bit too much. OSPF, BGP, you know, EIGP. And uh, I didn't really go into multicast or MPLS a lot, or as much as I should have. Uh, since this test hits you everywhere, you really have to get as good in advanced topics as you are uh, with your core topics. So yeah, I would definitely concentrate definitely will be concentrating more on MPLS and multicast and, and uh, you know, IPv6 tunnels and, and security, all that stuff, because Cisco assumes that you have core down 100%, right? 
like you are a robot in core. And then they, they almost do expect you to be the, almost the same in everything else. So that's their viewpoint. And you can kind of look at it as, you know, the way most people study, it's like a triangle. The bottom of the triangle is their core topics, and they study a little bit at the top of the advanced topics. You can't do that. Your layer two and layer three topics, when you add up the points, it's, uh, let me see if I could say this. Yeah, probably. If you get every question, every task in layer two and layer three correct, at least in my lab, that's less than 50 points. And so most likely you're not going to get every question. You're going to miss like a two point or a three point here. But it, assuming you got everything 100% correct, what they want to do, in layer two and layer three, that's less than 50%. So what does that tell you? You have to study everything. Like you can be godlike in core, you know, Scott Morris in core, you'll, you'll fail the config. So any questions about this part, what I'm concentrating on advanced topics. That's the main thing to take away from this is you may hate QoS. Yeah, that's your boogeyman, QoS. Oh, too bad. You got to do it. Uh, also, another thing is um, I had this idea before going into the lab that if I got a topic that I didn't like, I would just eat the points. Eh, three-pointer, I'll just eat it. QoS. Can't do that. Uh, it's because you need all the points you can get, so you can't just eat a topic. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to work. And you can't go into the lab hoping. This is, um, if you go into INE forums, there's a poster who said this. One of, the, one of their prolific guys that just got a CCIE. So you can't go into lab hoping that you don't get a particular topic, private VLANs or whatever, right? That's bad. The people who pass the lab are the ones that say, oh, yeah, I've studied all the topics, so they could give me whatever. Don't care, right? Just hit me with whatever. That's when you, that's when you finally pass. Okay, so almost to the end. We'll do some announcements and then audience questions, whatever questions you have saved up. So what have we done in the past? We're going to change things up. So we've done lots of meetings. We've done YouTube videos of all kinds. Uh, I've done the GNS3 configs for any the Narbic GNS3 configs, study planner for Narbic. There's links there. You can click on them. Um, expanded blueprints with links. Uh, a lot of people don't know about this. This is the expanded blueprint, and the links will link into the documentation CD, so you can get the PDFs. So we've we've done a lot already. So what are we going to do? So as uh, as was asked earlier, where do you find two months worth of troubleshooting labs? If troubleshooting is making people fail, how do we fix this, right? Because I think. We're, I think our what we've done already helps people with config. Not so much with troubleshooting. So here's how we're going to change it. I'm making a set of uh, what I call common troubleshooting topologies. Uh, they're GNS3 topologies that are already set up. So a 6 router 1, a 7 router 1, an 8 router 1, so on and so forth. Everything's already set up. So what that means is IPs are all can, already configured. That's one .NET file. In another .NET file, all the RIP is configured. In another one, all the uh, OSPF and all the BGP. And there's one where all the, all the, uh, it's multiple things. And there's one with MPLS. So everything already works. That's going to be put on the Router Gods webpage. And what's going to happen is uh, people can download them and change little things themselves. And it's, you're basically working backwards. And you, you don't have to use, these troubleshooting configs, but you could take an INE task, get it to work, and work backwards, right? What do we mean by working backwards? Okay, redistribution. 
you got this redistribution task to work. While you were doing this task, you screwed it up just by doing it. Like there were a couple times you screwed up. Well, that's a troubleshooting ticket, right? We're going to make a place on router guide so everyone can upload or either you email me. I'll figure it out how to do this. But we're basically going to try to make a library of troubleshooting .nets. And if you want to play around with troubleshooting every day, like you could do a puzzle or whatever. Narbic is doing the same thing. Right, so it's like your daily chess problem, your daily crossword puzzle. I can't do all of these myself. I can't make all the troubleshooting tickets myself. I'm going to make a lot of them, but um, you know, the CCNA guys can make them. The CCMP guys can make them. The guys going for CCIE can can make them. Right now, you're probably asking yourselves, if I've got a hundred new .NET files, what's the pain in the ass thing with .NET files? What do you have to change? the idle PC, the, where the image file points to. Because my idle PC is different than your idle PC. My image file is different than your image file. I'm going to have a, like 500 .NET files of troubleshooting. Like, and I'm going to download one every, you know, like a new one every day or 10 new ones every day. Pain in the ass, right? No. we got two phases on this one. Uh, first phase is got this new program. It's free. It's called Text Crawler. Now, Notepad++, I did make a video on how to do mass changes to, you know, you load in like 10 .NET files and so you change them all in one shot, right? I found something better. I found something that could do it to a whole folder and all subfolders. And uh, I don't know why I didn't find this before. Okay, so watch and be amazed. I'm going to make a video of this later, but... Um, so this is called Text Crawler. I've downloaded my Narbic configs. I've basically pointed it to it. And basically, it's going to look at all the .NET files. I'm going to click, uh, I want to find, what do I want to find? Idle PC. Right. So it's going to look through 400, it's like 500 .NET files. So these are all. So topology.net, there's idle PC in there, idle PC in there, and idle PC in there. You can see, boom, there's my idle PC. All I have to do is click on replace. So idle PC equals whatever, I would replace it with idle PC equals. Same thing for um, uh, the image file. Now, I'm automating this even further because this can save uh, details, the matches. All, all these uh, searches, you can save them. So I just give you whatever is saved. You you download text crawler yourself. You double click on whatever function I give you. And uh, it's a couple clicks away. And you can replace all the idle PC values and all the, the image values in one shot. So much, much better. I just did this the other day. It was like 15 seconds for me to, to transfer all the Narbic configs from one lap to the other, one laptop to the other laptop. I mean, it's it's awesome. So that's what we're going to do. Now, even this requires a couple of clicks. Um, I'm working on a Python program that will read your idle PC and image file from your .NET file that you already have. So it's going to rip it out. It's automatically going to, uh, you double click or whatever on a folder, and it's going to just slam it's going to just do the change for you. So I, I want to make it as easy as possible, but that's that's a little bit later because I have to do some Python magic for that. But uh, if you want to play around with it, text crawler, very, very good. I'm going to have a video about it later. Uh, but you know, that's kind of the stuff we are, we are working on. And uh, yeah, so basically it's kind of like uh, the the daily crossword puzzle, the daily chess problem, the weekend chess problem, more going to have more troubleshooting tickets. The way it's going to work is I'm going to upload a .NET file and I'm going to say, okay, in this .NET file, when you start it, there's going to be three tickets. Uh, ticket one, this can't ping that. Ticket two, this can't tell net there. Ticket three, this can't go here. And it's uh, your job to solve them. Right? Okay. Any lasting questions? Any questions about uh, that stuff? What we're planning to do? So, 
because I failed troubleshooting, I'm going to fix that problem. And by fixing it, uh, it's, it's kind of like what we've been doing with router gods before. By me teaching, it helped, it helped me pass config, so we know that works. So in order to pass troubleshooting, let's make a lot of troubleshooting problems, and everyone can do it. We'll just have this whole library, and uh, which I don't see people doing. So, so the one thing that I see, uh, not exactly wrong, but I need once you, if you want to practice troubleshooting, you have to like purchase their troubleshooting racks. Uh, yeah. So, if you're a CCNA guy, renting that CCIE troubleshooting rack is a little overkill. So, we're starting off a little bit small. Six router topology, then we go up. So, any lasting questions? So, who is going for their CCIE but has not scheduled their lab yet? So yeah, Sheldon. Now, here's the here's what I was thinking right before I scheduled my lab. Because this one of the common questions is, okay, you pass the written, you can schedule a lab pretty much any time, right? How do you know when you're ready to schedule your lab? Okay, because a lot of people say, well. I'll schedule my lab when I'm 100% ready. I'm going to tell you the truth. You're never 100% ready. I scheduled my lab uh, when I finished, uh, I think it was in, uh, I finished like Narbic's Foundation Volume 2 workbook. I had I had not yet started doing advanced routing and switching. So, you know, so definitely still a lot of stuff to learn. But I figured if I have to wait until I'm 100%, I'm never getting there. Because I, I don't know what 100% is. So it's basically, well, I've done multicast. I've done MPLS. It doesn't look that bad. Um, I've gone through workbook of one. F it. I scheduled it. Right? So that's a little high risk, but you're, you're, never, you're never going to be ready. Like 100% ready for this lab. So at some point, you just you just have to schedule it. After you schedule and you plunk down the credit card, you'd be amazed at how much you study. You'd be amazed at how much you focus after that. And after you fail, it's it's double. Like if, if CCIE is really what you want, you you study like even more after you fail. Which is pretty crazy. But yeah, you know, if you're scared about scheduling, everyone's scared about scheduling. You know, trust me. Now if you haven't if you haven't gone through workbook one or foundation volume one and two of Narvik, don't schedule. That's way too early. But uh, you know, if you've gone through the most of the stuff in the exam blueprint, uh, schedule it. Okay. Who here has uh not gone to any boot camp. You haven't gone to INE's boot camp. You haven't gone to uh, Narbic's boot camp or IP expert. You have not gone to any boot camp. Okay, so one of the questions that I see is is a boot camp worth it? Because boot camp's expensive, right? And I would say yes. And And here's the thing. When you go for a boot camp, you get the workbooks, at least in, in Narbic's case. And it's pretty much probably the same with I &E. They give you the videos and stuff like that. So you're buying the workbooks anyway, if you look at it. it so the work, the, the boot camp itself is only like $1,500 more above the cost of the, the workbooks. So the cost difference is not that much. Uh, but if I hadn't taken Narbic's boot camp, I would have gotten completely destroyed. Like it, it wouldn't have even been funny. Like, like 
config. I it just it would just been horrible. Five tickets out of ten wouldn't even. I doubt I would have gotten two tickets, because the cool thing about Arbix Bootcamp is you see the interface. You do a mock lab. That's the Cisco 360 lab, so you get to see that. Uh, also, you get the, the instructors there. Now, now realistically, I'll be honest. You take all these notes during the boot camp. I haven't, I haven't looked at them. I have like this workbook full of notes. I haven't looked at them. Uh, where the boot camp comes into play is you're meeting other people who are also studying. It's motivational. So it's like a kick in someone behind you just kick you in the ass and says, do it. Right? So yeah, so it's that. It's motivational. You're hanging out with people and you get the workbooks. All the studying you're doing afterwards with the workbooks. And that's that's where it's at. So is the boot camp worth it? Yes, it's worth it. It is a lot of money, but Can you still pass without the boot camp? Yeah, you could probably still pass, but damn. Like, how many more times do you have to take? How many more fails do you have to get? You know, <laughs> so I think I'm pretty good. I might, I'll probably pass the second time, but if I don't, hopefully the third time. But if I hadn't taken a boot camp, we're, we're looking at, you know, easy four, five, six times. So that's my that's my view on it. So Joshua has a question, uh, might be a bit off topic, uh, like your insight, but when I'm done with my CCNP routing and switching, should I go right into CCIE mode or gain experience in the real world? Personally, I would gain experience in the real world. Learn how to do things right, because CCIE is how to do things wrong. I, CCIE is just, it's like, the hell. Um, and, and you can go into the real world and kind of slowly get your feet wet into CCIE. Get some workbooks. You know, Volume 1. or Because you'll spend a year in Volume 1 in i &E, and e Same with Narabix Foundations. Um, and just kind of slowly work through them. You know, no time, no time limit. No, just kind of do them and, uh, you know, do it that way. And, and really, CCNP is, is a big um getting ccnp is pretty tough you know, i'm not gonna lie it's pretty tough and a lot of people need a little bit of break after that i know i did it's just you, know, you don't want to go straight into ccie yeah so the josh says i'm hungry to learn all the various technologies in ccie you're going to learn all the technologies whether you like it or not like there's some crazy yeah you're, you're going to see stuff in the lab that you're like, I've never seen this before. It's like, how would I do this? <laughs> That's pretty bad. But yeah. Okay, any other questions? So Scott has a question. Did you find it easier to stay motivated after taking the boot camp? Like the clock started ticking when you were done with class. Definitely. That is a huge thing with the boot camp. Is I I went into the boot camp kind of like, eh, you know, let's let's see. Let's see what this Narvik guy is all about, right? And then you go into this class, you get basically look at this guy, write down all the configs from memory. It's like, holy crap. And then you look at um, here's what's motivating, and it sounds bad. It, it sounds uh I don't I don't know if it's selfish or whatever, but when I was in class, all the boot camps, all three boot camps, I looked at the questions that other people were asking and how they were doing on the mock lab. And it was apparent that I was better than most of them. And the reason I was better is because I had done INE's workbook one and Foundation's workbook. It's kind of weird. Most people that go to Narbix Bootcamp don't do the Foundation's workbook. The, the, you get an email saying, do this before the bootcamp. They don't. So what motivated me was, oh, here's a, here's a bootcamp where most of these people are at the top of their company, and I'm better than most of them. 
So, hey, I got a shot at this, right? So, Nizam asked, does Narbic Cisco 360 assessment help? Yes, it helps in the sense that when you get the score report back, and, you know, mine was like 70-something percent, so I was like, well, shit, I have a shot at this. That's where it is. You, you take the assessment, and even if you get a low score, you get some things right, you go, I can I can get I can get 30%, right? Well, let's see if I can get 40%. You know, and so it shows you that you can beat this. Now, if you get zero, that's bad. But you know, the assessments really, really tell you where you're weak on and where you're strong in. And if you get 70 and up, that's a really good sign. It's awesome. Any other questions? These these are pretty good questions. I'm I'm glad that you guys saved them at the end, for the end. All right, I think that's it. Uh, we're clocked in according to my Camtasia timer, one hour forty seven minutes. I will be uh, rendering this out, uploading to YouTube, so you can rewatch it wherever. Uh, oh, another question from Nizam: Would it be better if the assessment is taken after the boot camp? Uh, so this this assessment is part of the boot camp. You you, you take it with the boot camp. So. Narbix boot camp the first day you get hit with a pre, like a assessment yeah it's day one you, it's uh that's like you introduce yourselves then it's the assessment so you get hit with it right away and then on Thursday night after you go through the lecture it's your uh, second assessment the first assessment's easy it's up to BGP it's a softball it's easy it's it's uh, if you've done the workbooks uh, the second assessment is a full lab it's a little tougher it's for troubleshooting. Um, there is no choice in um, whether you take it after. You can't schedule it afterwards. It's part of the boot camp. You have to take it during the boot camp because they have um, actual Cisco racks and gear uh, set aside for you somewhere at Cisco headquarters. Uh, that's also why you really, really, really should do the workbooks before you get to the boot camp because in my Malaysia boot camp there were people in there who hadn't done the foundation workbooks so that assessment is absolutely worthless to them because of course they're going to die you know they don't they, you can't even configure bgp at all so it's a worthless assessment but that that's an assessment that's part of your your boot camp when you retake the boot camp you don't get another assessment there's one shot because cisco charges i don't know like 800 bucks or whatever to Narbic. Narbic has to pay Cisco 800 bucks for that. So to get the full value out of the boot camp, you really should do the workbooks before getting there because your assessment's going to matter more. It will be more um, meaningful. Ah, the, the great question. So Anthony has a question. Good question. How many hours do you need to put into the workbooks? I stopped tracking my hours long ago. Um, it, it's just that I don't really look at the workbooks as a, a whole workbook. I look at it more of topics inside the workbook. Um, before the oh, so before the bootcamp. I went through the foundation workbooks or I, I went through INE's workbook one multiple, multiple times. So in terms of hours, God knows how many hours. But, uh, you know, Sheldon remembers all those, all of those sessions we had. And that cycle has been done multiple times. And in addition to everything we've done ourselves, you know, on your, on your own. So, you know, it's, it's not really in terms of hours. Some topics you get 
really good at in a few hours. Other topics require multiple times. And you get into this cycle where you do BGP, then uh, you do MPLS for a couple of days, and then you forgot everything you did in BGP, so you have to do BGP again. So it's just you have to keep going back until everything's automatic. So it's just, yeah, it's just a lot of practice. It's a lot of labbing, and it's, uh, I was told if you can configure a certain topic after being rolled out of bed while you're in deep sleep, the delta or whatever, delta wave sleep, you know, so you know, that you're deep asleep and just have someone punch you out of bed, and if you can configure BGP, that's when you're, that's when you're good. Okay, I think uh, that's it. We're at uh, hour and 52. So, everyone, thanks for attending. Uh, we, at least we know Google Hangouts works okay. Uh, this will be popped up on YouTube. I'll send a link everywhere. These are good questions. If you have uh, questions, you think about it later words, uh, email me, and um, I'll make another video about it. I'll just answer it on a YouTube uh, video. All right, and uh, see you guys next week in all those sessions next week. Yep, see ya.